First of all, good evening everybody. Uh, welcome to the Big Things Meetup here uh, at the DOD. And I have a kind of a habit, uh, so please bear with me and be embarrassed with me. We're doing a pretty selfie. Okay? <laughs> so everybody just raise your hands and say hi! Hi! Okay. One second. Okay, so good evening. Uh, welcome to our meetup, and we'll be focusing today on more introductionary uh, talks. Mine would be about big data and big data technologies, and Michael's would be about deep learning. So, say hi to Michael as well. Hi. Uh, just to start off, and to know the audience a bit. Who he is here is a programmer or a software engineer of some kind, data scientist, somebody from the tech world. Okay, who isn't? Minority, okay. So uh, this will be more focused to the minority here of the people who don't know the big data world and the deep learning world. And it will be more introductionary to all of these things. Uh, first of all, my name is Demi Benare. Uh, I will be and giving the first talk about quick dive into the big data pool. Uh, I'm currently, I'll do a, a short introduction, I'm currently the VP r and of a startup company that I founded with the two other partners. It's called Panorays. Uh, we're in the field of two buzzwords, big data and cybersecurity. Uh, in the past, I was a senior data engineer at a company called Windward. And uh, beforehand, I was at the Air Force around eight years in a missile defense system, I'm also a software engineer and a team leader. And uh, I'm also the co-founder of the community that you're all part of right now, it's called Big Things. We're focused in big data, DevOps, data science, and all the cool technologies that you hear and all the buzzwords that you hear uh, around the uh, So. And I'm sorry, I can't see my computer, so I'll be looking at the presentations a lot. Uh, today we'll be presenting the big data world. The basic concepts on, the, let's say, the basic technologies that we're using when we're speaking about the big data world. Uh, some introduction to the frameworks and uh, what is the tooling that we'll be using during the problem solving process. Uh, distributed uh, systems and all of the problems involved around monitoring of all of these things and eventually conclusions about it. Okay, each time you say the big data world and big data and I want to go into the big data world, you see these kind of tools uh, in front of your eyes. Apache Spark, MongoDB, the Hadoop ecosystem, Cassandra, and uh, S3, which is Amazon's like NFS. Any of you have used one of these in the past? Please raise your hand. Okay, awesome. These are great tools, but again, with all of these tooling and all of these new technologies, comes a bunch of problems that you need to face when you are, when you start solving your business problem. So let's talk about the, about the basic concepts of the, the big data world. Uh, let's define big data, and then again, it's my honest opinion about it. The the world of the three V's. Okay, this would be volume, velocity, and variety. And again, the question you should ask yourself is, how much data do I, do I have and do I need to process? How fast is it coming and what's the frequency that it's coming at? And by the way, the, the, all of the lectures uh, will be posted afterwards and the, the videos will be posted on YouTube as well. So, and be sure of that. And the variety, again, one of the things that define big data is the variety of your data. You don't know in which form it comes, and you don't know what kind of data comes, in what kind of formats does it come as well. There are some more people that actually add more Vs, and you can uh, define the seven Vs. The var uh, variability, when it's constantly changing and you don't know the schema of the data. And veracity, the actual accuracy of all of your data. You're not getting the exact same data as well. Visualization of all of this process, and of course, what value are you getting from the data? And uh, we can speak in more phrases. Let's say multi-region uh, When you have uh, all of your data spread across different data centers in different locations in the world, 
can bring lots of problems of latency and uh, of replication and things that we need to take into account when you come to solve your problems. And of course, uh, very fast and reliable responses because you want your user experience not to be like uh, really, really bad and uh, you don't want a uh, really high latency. And of course, no single point of failure because when you have a single database, let, let's say a single master database and it's down, your, all of your system is down and all of your services might not work. Why not relational data? Because it worked until now, right? Uh, up until, let's say, 20 years, most of the databases were relational databases and uh, everybody used to work with them and love them. Uh, most of that is because uh, relational models provide some kind of certainty about things, but uh, again, at, at very high costs, okay? Big table joins, billions of rows, when you're starting to involve massive amounts of data, you encounter lots and lots of problems. And uh, everything sharding, when you go and shard like uh, relational databases, everything becomes really, really fragile. And of course, there are many things in the new world, new age of mobile and uh, distributed systems when you can actually just leave things around, okay? You can do eventual consistency. Not everything should be committed and be in transactions. And uh, you want to save money, of course, okay? You don't want supercomputers. You don't want a mainframe in your organization to handle everything. And when you need to do replication over mainframes, I've never heard of it, actually. And this is a big problem. But you can relax all of these promises, and you don't always need them, okay? Not everything is a financial system. And I know many financial systems that rely on distributed frameworks like, uh, like the one that we're going to talk about. <laughs> Okay, by the way, am I talking too fast? No. Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, okay, what strategies do we need to take when we're trying to handle big data systems? Everything should be distributed across many, many nodes. Okay, so we need replication, of course. What happens in case some kind of node just dies? It happens, it will happen. Uh, just relax the consistency requirements, as we said. Okay, not everything should be like, and uh, the same answer from every, every place in the world because you need to replicate everything and, and something uh, might not get in a millisecond or two milliseconds to a different country. Relax the schema requirements because not everything has schema today, okay? We have lots of like, variety of data that comes without any schema, without some kind of protocol. JSONs or many data types that we can't even infer schema to. And uh, optimize your data and your data organization to the, to the actual need that you will need to use it uh, afterwards, okay? Don't, don't just throw it away to the database and uh, then it will query, I don't know, some kind of field, uh, one out of uh, 100, okay? You need to know your indices and you know to know where you put your data for like low latency. Okay, so let's look at the NoSQL, another buzzword, NoSQL landscape. Uh, eventually, you have many, many tooling around four main groups. Let's take the database world, okay? The database world is like uh, divided to the graph databases, which has many relationships. If you know all of Facebook's friends of friends and many features like these come from graph databases. Uh, you have distributed key value stores, which actually store many cache databases like Redis or Memcached or even some people use Cassandra or other kind of databases for key value stores. Document stores, which store JSONs and can query over them. Uh, the, the most known ones are MongoDB, uh, Elasticsearch, Couchbase, CouchDB, these kind of things. And wide column stores, which store like uh, data rows with hundreds maybe or more uh, columns, like Cassandra, like HBase. The key factors around these things are actually consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Okay, let's go for the next schema to see what's actually done there. Availability is, of course, the data should be available all times. Okay, consistency, it should be consistent over all of the, the, the nodes. And partition tolerance, what happens when I have the data sharded across. We can't have all of them. This is the biggest problem, okay? This is like the cap theorem. And uh, each database gives you two out of the three. And because of that, I like uh, bunch them around in uh, groups. We have the, the ones that gives you availability and partition tolerance, like Cassandra, DynamoDB, Raya, CouchDB, and Voldemort. But 
Cassandra might be like a bit different because you don't have consistency, but you have tunable consistency. Don't use it, okay? You can use like, with Cassandra, you can use a, a consistency level called all, but uh, usually it's uh, really not recommended because it gives you really, really high latency and it might fail and almost always it will fail. And on the other side, you have the available and consistent databases, the ones that you know and love, MySQL, Postgres, GreenPalm, Neo4j, the graph databases as well, and you have the ones that have consistency and partition tolerance, all the ones uh, below. A good tool which you can actually use before asking the questions to, uh, I don't know, some kind of big data expert, in which database to use, is it really well known, is it used in the industry as well, is the, the link uh, above. It's actually dbengines.com slash em ranking. It gives you a great graph of usage of all of the data databases, and actually like the leading ones are Oracle and MySQL and SQL Server, surprisingly, because they, they are here a really long time. And you can see the other uh, key value stores as well in a really nice uh, nice form, ni nice table, and you can see the ranking across time as well. So it's really nice to see where the new trends in the market going to. Okay, let's define another nice term, DevOps. Okay, who knows what DevOps is? Awesome. Let's define it, okay? This is actually the combination of two worlds that were like from the beginning of time of computer science, I think. The development side of the actual developers, software engineers, and etc., and the operation side, the sysadmins and the guys that actually install the servers. Nowadays, uh, all of the, the borders between these two worlds uh, kind of like fade, and we get the DevOps side, okay? And we get an engineer that should uh, know really well operation systems and all the underlying things and should know the development process to connect the developers to the operations. So we get this new kind of definition of cross-functional teams, operation, operational automation and developer operations as well. Okay, so this is like the, the end of the, of the beginning. <laughs> and let's start in the introduction of big data and uh, what's in this world and let's talk about a bit about the tooling. So we have the Hadoop ecosystem. And the Hadoop ecosystem actually was all uh, built ab up above the uh, distributed HDFS, which is the Hadoop uh, file system, and uh, the paradigm of MapReduce, which was the, uh, released by Google, I think, in 2005. And it was a paper that actually defined the new kind of computation, which actually existed before, but everybody tried to copy Google and try to implement the, the whole ecosystem that they implemented inside Google as well. So uh, it's mainly about really unstructured data, and really complex data, which is uh, vastly amounted, let's say, and uh, a system that runs on large, um, uh, large amounts of uh, machines which is distributed across sometimes availability zones or data centers, and a system that can uh, run on a, on a cluster of machines together. And which are the principles? It should be really flexible. It should be scalable when I need to scale my computation or scale my data. It should be low cost. I don't want to buy a mainframe and pay, I don't know, millions of dollars to some company that I won't say. Uh, and it should be fault tolerant because one thing that I can be really, really sure of, sure of in the software development world that things will fail, okay? And things should handle failure. Again, we've talked about the basic things of the Hadoop ecosystem, which are the HDFS, the MapReduce paradigm, and which was uh, the, another tool that was introduced in MapReduce V2, let's say, is Yarn. Yet another resource negotiator. Eventually, this is what actually like manages all of the resources in the cluster. I can run an AppReduce job and ask Yarn for some resources. I can uh, run a Hive job, uh, another Spark job, and do them uh, multi-tenantly on the same cluster. And I don't want to choke the cluster because in AppReduce V1, you would just consume all of the resources of the cluster. Again, it should be general purpose and uh, I haven't seen anybody use Yarn for things that are, are, are outside of the uh, Hadoop ecosystem. There are different kind of 
uh, resource managers like Mesos and uh, other things that actually handle different kinds of frameworks, but Yarn is mostly what comes with all the dis distributions that we'll talk about uh, the, in some of the future slides. And uh, it's mostly commonly used when you're using multiple frameworks inside the Hadoop ecosystem uh, simultaneously. Okay, so what we have in the Hadoop ecosystem? I haven't added the actual logos of all of the technologies, but we have Hive, Pig, many like databases or query languages that we have on top of the Hadoop ecosystem, which gives us much functionality over the basic concepts of MapReduce and HDFS. And you have the common, uh, the common library, Hadoop Common, which uses all of the basic uh, uh, types. It's all written in Java. Okay, most of the tooling, the, the bare bones of the Hadoop ecosystem is written in Java, and the higher level API tools are written in various systems that run over the JVM. There are many things even that run not on the JVM, and they come from the packages from, from the softwares that develop packages of, like distributions of Hadoop. Let's talk about the companies that are uh, actually vendors of these kind of distributions. So we have the mostly known ones, the Cloudera and Hortonworks, uh, MapR is less known here in Israel, but I do know of some companies that actually use it. All of them are like packages that gives you a bundle of pre-installed tools and actually like installation managers as well that give you all of the Hadoop ecosystem in a box. Okay, or many boxes that you can plug and play with your own network. Mostly the, the customers that go with these kind of solutions are um, let's say on-prem big companies that don't want to handle all the DevOps and they get some kind of working box. Uh, the downgrade of all of these that you can, when you need to upgrade things, mostly your on-prem is uh, disconnected from the outer network and you need some, some kind of way to import the packages and uh, pray to God that nothing breaks when you do install something. And this is the biggest problem because when you go out of the box that they give you, they test the box with the, all of the versions that come with it, but the biggest problem would be actually upgrading everything. But you have some other tools that give you some kind of boxes as well. If you're running on cloud, then you have uh, Google's Dataproc or Amazon's Elastic MapReduce, EMR. And you have a distribution by Datastacks that give you Apache Spark and Cassandra in the box. Everything is well tested in the configuration that they give you, but again, when you need to change things, this might be painful, nobody tells you that. So the new age of BI applications, able to understand various types of data, uh, the ability to clean the data, because most of the processing can the actual, actually I call myself a software plumber, okay, because most of the things is moving data across places and storing it in a different manner and doing some more transformations. This is like the whole thing of big data. 80% of the work would be in that, okay? and processing uh, all, of the, all of the data across distributed environments. Of course, when we have big data, we can't like, realize what's going on. We can't read everything. It's not possible and feasible. So we need a, a way to visualize the data, aggregate the data, and show it to our customers in a really nice shiny dashboard. And uh, then the last point is really relevant. OK, so again. Big data analytics, because they, you, people tend to use this buzzword uh, too. Again, it's processing large amounts of data, okay? And uh, mostly data can be distributed across nodes. It can be in memory, it can be on disk, and then like doing porting between the, the two of these. And everything should be super, super fast, because like if I run a query, I want to get from the big data distributed uh, databases a response that I would get from a re relational database. I don't want a query to take a day. But if it do a kind, some kind of aggregation, it might take a day, it might take even weeks. It depends on the amount of data that I need to, to scan. Okay. Uh, when to choose Hadoop, okay? And when to choose Hadoop over different uh, kind of solutions. When you have large amounts of data stored, and uh, you need to process everything, uh, I don't know, every day, every hour. And when you have semi-structured or unstructured data, which you need to have transform uh, every time and you don't have a reliable protocol, data is not categorized, lots of redundancy to the data because every message gives you lots and lots of data and you need to store everything. Complex, complex bad jobs that you want to do in parallel because you can't parallelize them. 
and you don't, don't know when the data might be useful. Let's say logs. Who stores logs? Don't lie to me. Everybody stores logs. Okay? And when you need to analyze all of these logs, it becomes a big data problem itself. So, what are the problems? Let, okay. The clicker is not working. What we had, again, 20 years ago and even yesterday, because every startup with, uh, which actually startups starts up to build something, starts up with building a monolithic system, which actually works on a single machine, uh, usually it's laptop. And uh, we have everything running on top of a single machine, usually. We sometimes even uh, are nice and uh, report everything to a monitoring system. But when we start talking about microservices, another buzzword, and uh, then we have some kind of weird uh, relationship between servers, okay? Team A might be uh, relying on service A with database A. Team B will be using service B and the cache over the database. And everybody is talking to some kind of distributed queue. Everything is going into web servers, web servers and another service that it's, is sitting on top of another cache over, over another database. And everything, of course, reports to some kind of analytics cluster that is running on top of our system. And again, we might have some kind of monitoring system if we're lucky. And this is introduces a lot of problems. Okay, let's say if we have a MongoDB in a combination with Spark, we have multiple servers, can be hundreds of servers, talking to a sharded Mongo, which have uh, which has a master slave uh, replication type, uh, replication strategy, which means lots and lots of servers. If we go into another distributed solution, let's say Spark working on top of Cassandra, another. Lots of servers, again, talking with lots of servers. And of course, why do we use Cassandra? Because we need indices over things to like give the data into our UI clients, to our web services. Uh, pinpointed data, of course. I don't want to like scan all of the data and give the relevant record. This introduces us with much problems. Okay, uh, multiple physical servers, multiple logical services. Uh, of course, we want scaling. Scaling is good, right? This means more servers. And uh, even uh, if you had metrics over all the data, you will be overflowed with the data. And the monitoring system becomes a big data problem itself. So this is the DevOps guy when he actually encounters all of these problems. It's really, really not nice. So monitoring is crucial. This is another good point to point out. So which kind of monitoring solutions do we need to give to our sysadmins and our, to, to our DevOps people and even to the business people? Uh, then uh, monitoring the operation system. Because we have multiple servers, we need to kind of aggregate the data and show it in a single dashboard. We want to know the CPU usage, the disk usage, because all of these softwares that we've talked about, the Hadoop ecosystem is running on top of JVMs, which are running as processes on the operation systems. You can't cap your CPU, okay? The HDFS is running on top of disks, physical disks that might fail. I want to know and to alert over these kind of things. And of course, memory. Everything is running in, uh, like, not everything, okay? Most of the things should be running in memory, in Spark. And what happens if you get to get cap of, of your memory? It will be really problematic. So, some help from the cloud. Everybody is talking about the cloud. You have built-in monitoring solutions when you're using both Amazon and Google, okay? Amazon has its own CloudWatch, and Google had bought a company called StackDriver, which is another tool that is embedded right now in the GCP console. It gives you zero to hero in monitoring really easily, and gives you lots of great tools that you can use. You can even install many like third parties, like New Relic, which gives you, again, a nice overview of all, over all of your infrastructure without much uh, hustle from your DevOps people. Where can you report everything? So everything can be plugged to a tool called Grafana, of course. Okay, this is one of the most common graphing tools today, and it's really shiny. Look, it's really nice. It's really easy to plug it to multiple data sources uh, like Graphite, Elasticsearch, CloudWatch. Uh, Prometheus, which I actually installed like two weeks ago, 
and uh, InfluxDB and many, many more. This is a real live community, and you can plug and play many of your tooling, even your application metrics to Grafana, and then do the correlation between application metrics and uh, system metrics, and even some kind of business metrics that you would like to add, and to know that uh, your database is on 100 CPU because some stupid developer uh, tried a select query over all of the data, and right now everything is really, really bad. Okay, so another distributed system. Cassandra, it's a great database. Everybody's talking about it. Most of the people are not using it for some reason. Why? Because they really don't know what's going on there. And you need to monitor it as well. So you have the built-in solution coming from Datastax, the company that actually backs Cassandra. And uh, it's a really great tool, but it's not customable. You can't add, like in Grafana, your own um, custom uh, metrics. So again, from zero to here, it gives you a great tool. But uh, when you need to customize things and to adjust things to your business needs, uh, it will be pretty problematic. So what to use? Both of them. This is the actual good, uh, good answer for it. And we actually implemented in the, past, in the previous company that I worked at uh, some kind of solution, a hybrid solution, which the actual Cassandra nodes uh, report to Datastax uh, Ops Center with their own agents and uh, also plug and play metrics that report into InfluxDB or Graphite. You would ask the important question, why to use this one or that one? Again, when you choke Graphite and you don't want to uh, handle the, the carbon backbone clustering, you will use some kind of time series database that is more performant, like InfluxDB. And even you can implement it with Prometheus, which all of these things work in a push model in which you push the metrics into. And Prometheus works the other way around. It actually scrapes all of the data from the destinations and it brings it into the Prometheus server, which actually like uh, unloads many, many, many uh, operations from it. Spark, we've talked about Spark. How many of you know Spark? Awesome tool, right? What? Samuspark. Samuspark, ah, yeah, it's a, it's a great tool as well. And uh, if you've used Spark and you've tried to deploy a Spark, uh, a Spark deployment in production, it's not as easy and not a silver bullet as they like as you would imagine it, uh, when you deploy it. You need to do a lot of wiring in the back end and you need to handle lots and lots of DevOps to keep a cluster functional, okay? This is one of the things that Databricks, the company that actually backs Spark, gives you a tool, a cloud-based tool called Databricks, which they handle all of these kind of things. I saw a lecture, I think it was in the, not the last Spark Summit, the one beforehand, and they gave a 15 minute presentation of all, all the new features of Databricks. And each and every feature, I'm just looking at it and I'm just like, Okay, that feature was a week of my life. That feature, I burned a whole month. And again, it's, it's checkboxes, okay? Launch a new cluster, okay? These kind of things. And they give it out of the box, but again, you pay for it. Uh, so, which are the tooling that we can actually monitor Spark with? So we have uh, not some kind of custom dashboard that is uh, created with uh, Grafana and Spark. We have the Spark UI, which is running on the online application running right now. We have the Spark history server to see jobs that were finished. And we have the Spark REST API, which we can query online and gather metrics over it. Let's say how many applications are running, how many applications were failed, uh, how many tasks were failed, etc., etc. And again, everything can be monitored in the basics as well. Okay, you can just go into a single server, again, in a single server resolution, and to query it with DSTAT, IOSTAT, ISTOP, uh, I, IOTOP, and JSTAC, which are like regular OS metrics that you can gather, but gives you lots of information about why is the server not performing. Monitoring your data. Okay, we have all the infrastructure, and we've talked about it, but what about the actual data? You want to know what's going on with the computation and all of your results, what's going on? So, did all the computation occur? It's really important to know, okay, I have a, some kind of workflow, did everything happen? Uh, are there any holes in the data? Are, are there any layers missing? Do I need to recalculate things? Uh, okay, most of you are software engineers. How many of you can actually say how much data do you have in your system? In the whole system? Even an estimate, okay? Amount of gigabytes, please raise your hands, I want to hear. 
you're great people, okay? It's one of the hardest jobs that you can actually answer, okay? How much data do you have? Because most of the people that come to me and say, okay, I have a big data problem. Ah, okay, so how much data do you have? What's the frequency? And when I ask these questions, people actually don't know. It's not, and it's not because they're not smart, because they don't know. It's really, really hard. And of course, it's all of the data in the database. When I have terabytes and petabytes of data in the database, how should I know if I have the single data point or it's missing? It's really hard. Query everything and to check if, if everything is there, it's pretty hard. So if you can, you can do it like periodically, you can test a, a daily result and to verify that you have a, the, a subset of data of the, that day is feasible. But querying all of your data is pretty, very hard. So we get into a new, uh, a great, let's say, term that a friend of mine defined, data quality assurance, okay? Data QA, sounds great. So, what are the data answers for these kind of questions? So eventually we get to, um, let's say, we need to measure, can we follow the results over time, okay? What's the data flow, what might fail? And, of course, we need to answer everything with monitoring. And, of course, don't blame the DevOps guy, okay? Monitoring should be for all the people in the company. Even the developer that actually introduces a new feature, he needs to monitor it and to know how it's doing. Is it performing well? Is it doing its own job? And not say, okay, everything worked in dev, uh, this is the operations problem. Because most of the companies do so. Again, we've talked about logging, okay? So you have many logging solutions as well. You have the more paid ones, let's say Splunk, uh, which I hear is a great tool, I've never used it uh, in my life. But uh, you have the open source tools as well, which of course need uh, some handling and installation with the DevOps things. And the Elk stack, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana, some more shiny dashboards, which means nothing to you right now, but it really looks cool. So, if we summarize things, and we want to define the monitoring stack that we should use, I, I intentionally removed all of the tooling around, because you can solve it in any manner that you'd like. You need to think about how you're collecting your metrics, and the data monitoring thing, storing everything in some kind of data store, and showing everything in a nice dashboard for you, for, for it to be easy to you to monitor everything. Of course, alerting over things, and the most important things is alerting over things that you can actually respond to. Because alerting over uh, the, I don't know, uh, some kind of failure that I can, can't do anything with the production system, is really meaningless and people will like ignore it eventually after one or two messages. And of course, log monitoring, which we showed beforehand. So, let's go back to the beginning, which we asked these kind of 3V questions. Uh, what's the right questions to ask? So let's ask the right questions. Can it run on a single machine? About like, meaning the volume size in a reasonable time? Um, and again, can a single machine handle all of the throughput that is coming, that all of the data is coming at? And the variety, is your data constantly changing? Okay? It's not constantly changing, I'm sorry. <laughs> if your answer to that question is yes, or all of these, or some of these, think about if you want to go into that mess. Okay? We've talked about so many problems that may occur during the process. Think about it if you want to go inside that world or not. Because many things could be solved, let's say, in two hours, three hours, or four hours of computation. The amount of resources that you will invest into running all of these systems would be much, like, much, much more than a couple of hours. Okay, and if you know it, you're people from the industry, you know the real expensive thing is developers, okay, and not infrastructure. So just throw at it another server, try sharding things, and don't go into complex solutions, which will only give you trouble. So, conclusions. Think carefully before going to the big data pool, okay? Think if you actually need it. Don't go with the buzzwords. You can go with other buzzwords. Microservices work as well. It's a great buzzword. You can implement it, and you can uh, work with Docker and things like it if you want to do cool things. But if you need the complexity, go for it. If you don't need it, think about it like three or four times before you do so. 
uh, take means to automate anything. Automate and monitoring, automation and monitoring is one of the key components of a good and like reliable working big data system. Okay, and invest lots and lots of time on it and don't say, okay, I will do it later after that feature because people tend to do so. And again, fit your storage layers to the needs because not everything would work on Cassandra. Not everything would work on HDFS. Every persistency layer has its own advantages and its own disadvantages. And don't say, okay, I will let's say, rape that solution and bring all, all of the things to it. So, still feel like you're drowning in the big data pool? Okay, questions. I know I spoke really, really fast. <laughs> Nothing. Mm, surprising. Okay. So uh, again, I will introduce you to some of the links the, of the community. Uh, first of all, you can get to handle me in any like social media measure that you'd like, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, email, ask questions, you're really welcome. I will try to respond in a really low latency. I will try. You have all of the community links, uh, the meetup group, the YouTube channel, which uh, all of the lectures will be posted to as well. Uh, Facebook group which we share data and actually ask questions and you can actively ask whatever you want and people are really nice and they answer really really fast and really surprised that most of the times they answer much faster than the psych overflow and thank you very much and it's really really funny everybody's posting that we're hiring so we're not hiring right now. So thank you. Okay, right.